And how's theory supposed to prepare us for what's out there? I'm looking at you, theory university work. There is nothing out there. <laughs> Who'd want to attack children such as yourselves? Hmm? Oh, I don't know. How about, um, let me see. Um, uh, what about, um... Oh, what about Lord Voldemort? Death Eaters. Yes, uh, Lord Voldemort's Death Eaters. Right, Harry? Uh, Death Eaters, yes. Uh, Lord Voldemort's Death Eaters. Yeah, even if you don't believe the Dark Lord's back, you can't deny his Death Eaters are around. Look at the Quidditch World Cup last year. <sighs> Good goodness, goodness. Well, I suppose you're right about those Death Eaters. But make me make one thing very, very clear. You have been told that a certain... Dark Wizard has returned. This is true, but for the purposes of this story, I'm going to tell you that it's a lie, because I'm I'm an idiot. Um, somehow I'm, I'm power I'm a power craving, uh, hungry idiot. So the Dark Lord returning is in fact a lie. It's not a lie. I saw him. I fought him. Ron, why have you got Dumbledore's wand? Oh, um. Well, some people subscribe to this theory that I am Dumbledore, somehow. But in reality, I'm just looking after it for him. It's uh, okay. I just wanted this. I just wanted this in the in the sketch. I just wanted this this replica, this this, this replica uh, thing from Forbidden Plant. I got from Forbidden Plant in Cambridge. I just wanted this in the sketch and the review. Okay. Just wanted an excuse to have it. Makes sense. Actually kind of ties in really well with having a, a mention to that theory. Which I personally don't subscribe to. gentlemen nick here and welcome to my review of the fifth harry potter film harry potter and the order of the phoenix which to be fair is my least favorite harry potter film or at least at the moment and yeah the main problem i have is actually the story well part of the story really i mean not the whole story also this is a 12 inch dumbledore wand that i got last week so that's pretty cool um yeah, hoping to get Voldemort's as well later down the line. I've got a bookmark as well. No Harry, though. It's a shame I didn't see the Harry one. Well, not one of these ones. There's the more expensive one. Yeah, there was the more expensive one at Forbidden Planet Cambridge, but I didn't have enough money for that. Anyway, but Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Well, no, yeah, the main, main problem is I don't really like the whole Ministry Against Harry Dumbledore story nor the Umbridge stuff. I can understand why this, it's there, but I don't really like that. I find it a bit annoying and uh, very difficult to watch or read as well in the book. And it's actually kind of worse in the book. So actually they kind of, uh, it's not so bad in the film because it cuts down a few more bits and there isn't a huge amount of time to it. There's not, I mean, it's stuff throughout the whole film, but uh, you do get move on to other scenes that are less grating, especially the last 40 minutes. The last 40 minutes are awesome. They are epic. Ah, oh, I love the last 40 minutes. Um, or, or last 30 or, uh, or 25 minutes uh, because of the credits. But yeah, uh, but the last act is brilliant. And there are parts of the other two acts that are also brilliant. We just have to go through a lot of um, Dolores Sunbridge stuff and a lot of Ministry, Anti Potter, Dumbledore stuff. But I think there's more there's more of that in the book, so it's not as grating in on screen, which is probably one of the things I'm happy about the film's uh, cutting or not having as much of because um, 
because it was very grating in both versions, then I'm actually happy that they are able to not have as much of it here. Uh, fakes the story and most of the best stuff of the film actually has nothing to do with that or very little to do with it at least and it doesn't interfere with the main plot however it does mean that we do get the really cool Dumbledore's army scenes and so the plot is very necessary because it does mean that Harry has to step up and teach defense against the dark arts to his uh, peers and this all leads to a fantastic final battle in the department of Min of mysteries at the ministry of magic and it is possibly the best climax of a Harry Potter film before Deathly Hallows Part 2. It is amazing. Also, I really like the stuff that they did with Sirius. Because considering that they only had one scene with him in the last film, they have to make a more emotional connection between the two characters, uh, between him and Harry here, so that his death is a bit more impactful, so it's a bit more meaningful, and it's very, um, more like the book, quite shocking. And I think they succeed perfectly. Um, similarly, I think they also have fantastic cast for new characters. And Mildred Staunton, whilst I hate the Lord Umbr Umbridge, uh, I don't think there's very few people, there's many people outside of a couple of characters in the in the books and films, such as Filch and maybe some of the Slytherins. But aside from those characters, I don't think there's any person, or many people anyway, that like the Lord Umbridge. I do not think there's many people who like her. And you can tell, I mean, that is kind of the point of the character, but... Yeah, um, although there are some good scenes with her, such as her comeuppance um, with some centaurs. And Emilda Staunton was perfectly cast for the character. She is a, she, she's revelling in the role. She's brilliant. Um, sim similarly, Helena Bonham Carter is also perfectly cast as Bellatrix Lestrange, one of our new villain, our new uh, main female villain of the series. Um, and also... Come, um, can't remember her name. Ivana Lynch. Ivana Lynch is brilliant as Luna Lovegood, who is now one, who is one of our main six pro uh, young protagonists in the the Palm to Ministry battle. Um, and she is able. She's only just been introduced in this first in this story book and film. She's only just been introduced, but she gets to step up to a very high level and proves herself to be a brilliant character throughout. And she joins Harry, Ron, Hermione, and also Neville and Ginny, who also step up to help fight in the in the battle all six of them proved to be incredibly um skilled and powerful wizards young wizards and witches and we've got ourselves a very good team here um and also when showing the Dumbledore's army stuff we get to see quite a few of the other students um show off their power uh, their skills with the uh defense against the dark arts whilst also uh learning skills by skills and it's great to see harry as well as also ron and hermione to a lesser extent uh, teaching the Defense Against the Dark Arts cl um, secret classes. They're gr it's great. Um, so, yeah, there's it's quite a lot of great stuff in this film. It's just that I just really don't really just like, don't like the whole Ministry and anti-Potter, anti-Dumbledore stuff. And Dolores Umbridge can get very grating. And this does kind of affect my overall enjoyment of both book and film. I think it's worse with the book because there's more of it. Um, so that's kind of... I can kind of hate, thank the film for less of it, um, although it's still a major part of it. But there's still some really great stuff. And The Order of the Phoenix, also brings more cast to talk about there. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think George Harris is Kingsley Shatterbolt. He's great. And Natala... T T Natala... Til Tilda? Tala? Tana? She's also great as a fun... And if Endora Tonks. And of course, Brendan Gleeson is playing Mad-Eye Moody this time. Um, after the last film where he was playing what well, kind of he did have a one scene with as mad eye moody well two scenes actually as mad eye moody but one of them was locked in a trunk and one of them was a memory flashback the rest of the time he was playing barty crouch junior disguised as mad eye moody so it's great to see him having a bit more action in this film as the real mad eye moody um unfortunately there isn't as much scenes with him and it is a bit of a shame that he will die in film seven when there, we haven't had a huge amount of moody action besides well, there are two great bits in this film and a few other good scenes with him, um, but not much with him. And he doesn't appear in film six. He gets a few scenes in seven, but he does die early on, sadly. So I think if he was in the sixth one, I don't even remember if he was in the sixth book either. But if he was more involved in the sixth one, um, maybe a little bit more here, then I think his death would be possibly as impactful as Sirius's when we come to uh, Deathly Hallows Part 1. Um, 
Visual effects also looking really good. And David Yates knows how to direct a film. It looks stunningly beautiful. There is a few editing niche issues. And when Bellatrix first reveals herself to the children and Lucius, there is a little bit of a... You can tell, notice that she's not actually speaking. Um, visually, she's not moving her mouth, but you can still hear her voice. There is a few other times of that that happens. What I mean, it's like the uh, Harry's vision of Voldemort and Sirius. It's, he's sort of seeing it and he's sort of hearing them. But you don't see Voldemort moving his his mouth. Um, but you could probably tell that it's talking at a different point in time. And it's all merging together in this head um, dream sort of thing. With Bellatrix reveal at the Ministry, it, that's just bad editing uh, and bad camera shots. Whoops. And there is actually a, couple, a little bit of a slightly noticeably clunky editing around that point. So it's forgivable though. The scene is still a brilliant scene anyway and still some really great stuff. Brilliant visual effects as well. The festivals look great, although there are some bits where it does look uh, off, uh, obviously uh, CG. Same for Grawp, but they still look really great and really well done. I think they take their time when doing these visual effects to make them look really great. And I can certainly say that they definitely look brilliant. Even the weaker ones look, uh, look brilliant or at least uh, realistic enough. Uh, they'll, they'll pass. I think these ones are slightly less realistic than some of the last, the earlier ones or some of the later ones, but they still have uh, still done really brilliantly. And the music is also brilliant. Nicholas Hooper provides the score for this film and the next film, and they sound really great and really upbeat. I mean, it's not quite as dark or atmospheric as Mike Newell's themes, but they're not quite the same themes as John Williams, um, but certainly uh, proved to be a fun, entertaining. Uh, score for the most part whilst also providing the darker and more uh, somber and quieter moments when they need to and also I have to praise Daniel Radcliffe this is possibly his best performance or at least as Harry Potter uh, this is his best Potter performance he doesn't quite not quite as good in the next couple of films but he's still really great um, but this is possibly his best performance he's de he's at his the character's at his lowest point in his life where very few people will believe him and he's, and he's trying to help everybody, but it's just making things worse until he has the chance to save the one person he um, considers to be the only uh, family he's got until that person dies and um, who is serious. And when he dies, that is possibly the, meth, the biggest blow to Harry, even more than Cedric or even Dumbledore. Um, it's the, his biggest blow. So, yeah, you can get... You can kind of see the emotion and Radcliffe does a perfect performance throughout the movie. And yeah, I think he does continue to do well with the following three films, but not quite as good. I think definitely Harry's part two is the next closest, but he still does brilliantly. Same for Rupert Grint and uh, Emma Watson, who will also go on to be uh, brilliant in the future films as well. And they all do great. And it's also fun to see the Weez, uh, Weezy Tring, uh, twins, Fred and George, have a bit more involvement in the film not so much in the uh, main story of the film but they get more involvement across the film and they have some of the best scenes or best lines in the film and they they prove to be brilliant um so on the whole harry potter and the order of the phoenix is a great film and great adaptation this is also i consider films six and eight not to be as closely adapted to the books as one to five or even seven i actually think seven's a pretty good uh, a pretty close adaptation but six and eight kind of differ quite a bit so I think apart from seven this is the last one that's going to be very close to the original book it's going to differ quite a little bit um or at least it certainly does for in eight uh six might not be as much um they, they they all follow the books very closely but I think as we're going as the books have been getting longer some of them have been uh differing a bit more um but I certainly think this one, without having too much into the film, it's able to um, it's able to show the main story, have the main characters, and pretty much gets us rolling for the next film reference. And yeah, it sets sets it up really well. I mean, it does. I did feel like before I rewatched it, it felt like it, and also film six, um, Half of Prince, also in the book as well. Uh, the books and fifth and sixth books and films did feel like they were stalling for time between. Goblet of Fire and Deathly Hallows, but after rewatching this, um, for actually it's a bit better, it's, it's a bit more enjoyable, and this bit is necessary for the Dumbledore's army stuff. So that, and also these end uh, stuff at the end, 
And it proves to be ex uh, exceptionally gr brilliant. And half the print is also necessary for the Hawkrat stuff. So it's actually handled really well. It's just that there are the same problems I had with the book, except there's not as many. Uh, it's not as um, focused on as much, or at least not for uh, too long anyway. And still handled brilliantly. So I'm going to give Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I was originally considering 8, but after rewatching it, I liked it a bit more, and I still think it's a very good, very strong film and a great adaptation. Though it, there are parts of the story I'm not a fan of. And uh, that's why it's a 9, but otherwise it probably would have been a 10. And the same would probably go for the next two as well. Probably there are some some plot points or some film uh, changes that we're not taking on, but there'll probably still be high scores, but not quite 10. Um, but, yeah, but Order of the Phoenix is... Definitely a brilliant watch, and I highly recommend it. Um, maybe not as much as the other films, but certainly highly recommend it. Anyway, that's it from me. Thank you for watching. Next time, I will be reviewing the sixth Harry Potter film, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. And I'll see you guys next time. Until then, mischief managed. And yes, I know that's from Prisoner of Azkaban, but I've got the wand to do it with, so... Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Nicholas Payne Retro YouTube channel. Which is one of the few, uh, which, was, which is one of the things that the films are a prop, um, I <laughs> am, and quite a lot of the best scenes are stuff that do not deal with that, uh, unless it's in a epic, cool, uh, really fun, cool fight. Um, so, yeah, it's just like... Ah! And the dual fights are all... And the fights are awesome as well, and... The she proves to be... Uh, all, all six of them prove to be incredible um, dueling... Uh. Excuse me. But in those cases, you can hear that it's, sort of, it's in the it's possibly in the hair. Harry's thinking, it's in, hearing it, but it's not linked, synced up with characters what they're doing at the time. I mean, you, I mean, what, I mean, what I mean is that you might, this, uh, and the scene goes in, starts going really, and um, and the Dumbledore's army, and there's, ah, uh, I'll cut that bit until there is a point where he. It seems like there is a time where he can go and rescue the one person he ha who he considers family, or at least uh, who he uh, family, family. I mean, um, only family. He's uh, not <laughs> non wink. Um, and how's theory supposed to prepare us for what's out there? I'm looking at you, university work. That's not sorry. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Um, how about... Oh, I don't know. Um... It's not a lie. I fought him. God. I... It's not a lie. I fought him. I saw him. No. It's not a lie. I saw him. I fought him. God. This is annoying. This is very annoying. <sighs> 
Ron, why have you got the Elder Wand? And I didn't even know if the Elder Wand was at the moment. Ron, why? It's not a lie! I saw him! I fought him! Ron, why have you got Dumbledore's wand? Why did I surprise? I'm gonna do that again. Hmm. Yeah, um, very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't believe Lord of Voldemort's back, then... I know that I'm the ma I am the master of the Elder Wand in this sketch. I shouldn't know that for two more s <laughs> two more stories, <laughs> three more films, uh, but two two more books. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that, that's that's enough of that. There is nothing. Else. So it's a lie, but. I know, I'm just, just... <laughs> you have been told that this theory is... No, I'm gonna cut it down. <laughs> the first Doctor would be very... Very disgusted in me, wouldn't you, Doctor? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I couldn't do how she does it. There.